Perfect. And the last thing that uh, I I leave you, it's my name, which is Andrea. You can uh, find me on the application that uh, we have uh, for this conference, uh, WAVA. And uh, if you have any issues during the panel, you can reach me out uh, through the uh, the application. Okay. Uh, uh, no, I don't quite really understand how. how oh yes, uh, there is a, a an application that uh, comes with the conference, uh, which oh. is WAVA. Let me show. Uh, it should be. Uh, I, all of us are, are in this on this uh, uh, application, and you can reach me out uh, here on the basically on on your application on your phone or oh, on, on your my computer. phone. Okay. Yeah. Before okay. before you go, could we hear from Paula just to hear if the audio is working? Paula, could you like say something at random? Paula, is she frozen? Is she frozen uh, or is she? Hey. So, yeah, it's fine. Uh, could you could you like uh, uh, speak a can little you, bit? Because it's freezing on me. Yeah. What? Yes. Can you can you hear me now? Okay. But yeah, it, like, the connection I, keeps going in and out. So. I I see. Well, I guess we'll just have to try to make do that. Seem not too bad, actually. Um, okay. Are we ready to go, everybody? Okay, so enjoy your conference, your panel, and if you need me, so you know how to reach me. Okay, yeah. I will jump in in the in, okay, so just to yeah. make sure that I have okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Honestly, I don't really know how to reach you, but uh, oh, oh, hopefully, uh, I won't need you. I love the glass of wine, by the way. <laughs> but, thank you so much. Bye -bye. All right, well, uh, here we are. Paul is Paul here. Has Paul disappeared? Oh, no. He's frozen, I think. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think we might have, Paula, I think we might have problems with your internet connection. Let's just, let's just see, I guess. And let's hope for the best, my, my fallback strategy of everything. Um, okay, uh, thank you all for being here. It's delightful to see you all uh, on what's, a, uh, I guess, a mid-morning for me here in Southern California. Um, I'm going to introduce our four distinguished speakers, and uh, then uh, we will begin. Uh, <clears throat> Paula Hayes is an instructor at the University of Memphis. She writes both poetry and poetry criticism. Her works include the book, uh, which I recommend, Robert Lowell and the Confessional Voice. That's Peter Lang, 2013. Her poetry has been published in a variety of online and print journals. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Philip McGowan, uh, coming to us from Belfast. Uh, Philip is president of the European Association, excuse me, European Association for American Studies. He teaches American literature at Queen's University in Belfast. His books include American Carnival, Seeing and Reading American Culture, Prager 2001, and Anne Sexton and Middle Generation Poetry, that's Prager 2004. He's recently published an article, Elizabeth Bishop and Modernism in Angus Cleghorn and Jonathan Ellis's collection, Elizabeth Bishop in Context. Our third speaker is Hannah Baker Saltmarsh, who's the author of the poetry collection, Hysterical Water, University of Georgia Press, 2021, and the critical book, Male Poets and the Agon of the Mother, Context in Confessional and Post-Confessional Poetry, that's the University of South Carolina Press, 2019. She's Assistant Professor of English at Mount, Mer sorry, Mount Mercy University. Uh, our fourth speaker is Adam Beardsworth, uh, Associate Professor of English at Memorial University of Newfoundland, Grenville campus. His recent articles include Panic, Don't Panic, Poetry and Politics from the Cold War to Trump in Canadian Review of American Studies and Yates's influence on Robert Lowell's political poetry <clears throat> in Cobain and Coleman's, Eve Cobain and Philip Coleman's Robert Lowell and Irish Poetry. His book, Confessional Poetry in the Cold War, eagerly anticipated by me, uh, will appear from Palgrave in 2022. 
So uh, very uh, wonderful panel and wonderful uh, uh, participants all around. And so uh, with no fear, further ado, uh, let's begin with Paula Hayes, uh, who will speak to us on tracing theodicy within the religious impulses and spiritual skepticism of Robert Lowell. Paula. Paula may be frozen. Uh, Paula, uh, I can't quite hear you. Paula, uh, Paula are you there? Can you hear me now? It It's freezing like every few seconds. Yeah, I can um, hear you right now. Okay, good. But it, it keeps it keeps doing that. It's showing the connection is weak. Um, so hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, I missed let's... what you said just prior. I heard the introductions and then it froze after that. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't really understand that, that sentence. Um, I was saying that I heard the introductions, and then right after that, it froze. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, uh, why don't you do uh, what you think best, and maybe get your best sentences in early, because it, it seems like you may be going in and out. Uh, I. Good luck. <laughs> Am I am I presenting first because I'm uh, yeah you are okay you would you rather go later you you need yeah, some time to work on your connection if I can get a better connection okay but why don't we do that and so we'll come back to Paula and uh, thanks Paula and looking forward to hearing your paper and um, for now we'll move on to uh, my co-host uh, Philip McGowan. Oh, Philip, I can't hear you. No, I'm fine. I'm good. Okay, oh, good. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I hope this doesn't collapse everything for Paula, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it might. Um, slideshow. Okay, can everyone see that? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to be talking today about um, Elizabeth Bishop's poem, In the Waiting Room. I, I'm sure you all know it very well. Um, and uh, the, the, I think the thing, this is in no way final, okay? So this is going to be the equivalent of me throwing a few ideas up in the air and just see where they land. But there's something about this poem that I keep coming back to and I keep thinking there's something that she's trying to tell us more than just the story that is unraveling within this poem about going to the dentist's waiting room, being with her aunt Consuelo, and then sort of coming into consciousness as a, as a nearly seven-year-old girl. I'm going to play just that bit on the screen. I'm going to play Bishop reading that. Let's hope this works. In Worcester, Massachusetts, I went with Aunt Consuelo to keep her dentist appointment and sat and waited for her in the dentist's waiting room. It was winter, got dark early. The waiting room was full of grown-up people, arctics and overcoats, lamps and magazines. My aunt was inside what seemed like a long time. And while I waited, I read the National Geographic. I could read and carefully studied the photographs. The inside of the volcano, black and full of ashes. Then it was spilling over in rivulets of fire. Now, I know you're all familiar with this poem. I'm guessing that. Uh, so I'm going to jump ahead with a few ideas in it. Uh, the, the standard readings of this poem are you know, a girl coming into consciousness, uh, the metaphor of the volcano, perhaps as a kind of latent or dormant sexuality uh, that, is, that breaks out in the world. And that once she realizes her own identity as a young female, when she sees the pictures in the National Geographic, she faints. Then she comes back into it and she's back in Worcester, Massachusetts at the end of the poem. Now, this was first published in The New Yorker in uh, July 1971, and Lowell uh, did note in letter to Bishop that it's the nearest thing you've written to a short story in verse. And I think there is a story or actually multiple stories within this poem that people haven't necessarily 
cottoned on to. Now, I might be totally wrong, but I'm, I'm going on a hunch on this one, so come with me. Uh, I've long been intrigued by this poem and its navigation, its articulation of this child coming into selfhood, of her recognition of gender identity and sexuality's latent potentiality, and psychoanalytic readings focus on the, the adult bishop and her return to Worcester, Massachusetts to write this poem from the point of view of a child. Um, and you know, one of the things, this poem circulates and, and pivots around this idea of the unlikely nature, how unlikely it is that we are related to anyone, how unlikely, how did I come to be here like them, like her aunt? And this sort of unlikeliness and, and Bishop stating that, separated out with a dash and then with the ellipsis, how unlikely. So what the rest of this talk is going to be is possibly unlikely, but maybe perfectly unlikely for what Bishop might be doing in this poem. Nothing stranger could ever happen. This poem is a poem of return and a poem of internality in the waiting room, in Worcester, Massachusetts, in the dentist's waiting room. I, my aunt was inside what seemed like a long time, the inside of a volcano. And then at the end of the poem, then I was back in it. The war was on, outside in Worcester, Massachusetts. So she repeats that phrase and that's like, that has set off a clang in my head about the repetition of that phrase in Worcester, Massachusetts, bookending the poem. And that sense of the outside in has allowed psychoanalytic readings of this poem in terms of you know, Freudian uh, thoughts about uh, childhood or, or even Jungian thoughts about childhood development. Um, and, and that's where I kind of want to take a lot of what I'm interested in here. This poem is a kind of it's, a, it's an overflow of interiors, or as Ashbury would say in Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror, a magma of interiors. The more you look at it, the more internalized and internal it becomes. It's a poem about repetition and return. In Worcester, Massachusetts, then I was back in it, outside, in Worcester, Massachusetts, keeping that repetition going and that sort of eternal return, perhaps, that might be interesting. Um, now, big things are important here. There's a sort of passing mention of the war, but the war is vitally important as a kind of temporal coordinate. The war was on. And she just leaves that there. I want to come back to that in a second. But thinking about Worcester, Massachusetts got me thinking, why does she keep telling us that it's in Worcester, Massachusetts? What, what's in Worcester, Massachusetts that's so important apart from this dentist's waiting room and her aunt Consuelo? or Anne Florence, as it was in real life. Now, we know the bishop uh, was raised partly in Worcester, Massachusetts, by her aunt after she had a kind of nomadic, difficult childhood. So that's important. That sort of point of origin, point of genesis, maybe. But thinking about Worcester, Massachusetts in a slightly wider frame, well, the only place that Freud and Jung spoke publicly in the United States in their tour in 1909 was in Clark University, which is in Worcester, Massachusetts. Now, that might be a coincidence. I think it might be, but it might not be a coincidence. Freud delivered five lectures while he was here at, or there. I, I'm not there. So anyway, uh, he delivered five lectures, one on infantile sexuality, um, another on transference, and Carl Gustav Jung also gave three lectures. One in particular about um, child psychology and particularly based on female child psychology. And I think that's interesting in relation to this Bishop poem, because that is kind of what Bishop, that's the territory that she's, she's walking us through, female child psychology. So I think, you know, that's one thing I want to throw up in the air. Now, I was supposed to go and do research on this last year, but the pandemic stopped me traveling to Clark University. It was all set up and then, darn, I couldn't go. So hopefully in the future, I'll get to go and look at some of these things. But I also want to look at uh, the, the Bishop sort of uh, family line in Worcester, Massachusetts, where maybe Anne Consuelo stroke Florence went to the dentist, who her dentist was. 
that kind of stuff from the public records that I might not be able to, to access from here. Now, speaking of Freud, Sigmund Freud knew dentists very well, or in particular, he knew this dentist extraordinarily well, Hans Pickler. In 1919, Hans Pickler is uh, Freud's Austrian stomatologist. He diagnoses Freud's maxillary jawbone cancer from which he suffers for the, pretty much the remainder of his life. And he conducts, I don't know if anyone here doesn't like going to the dentist. Uh, I certainly didn't when I was a child, but I definitely would not want to go this many times to the dentist. Pickler conducts around about 25 operations on Freud's right-hand soft palate, his hard palate, the patioglossal arch, the oral mucous membrane, and the rear mucous membrane of the mandible between 1923 and 1938. He fits a prosthesis, which Freud calls the monster, because he cannot speak with it, and he just he hits and he has to hold it in place the whole time. So a lot of these operations weren't very, very successful. Freud has to return to Pickler surgery 143 times in the two years, 1923-24, a further 122 times between 1926-1928, and another 94 times in the year 1932 alone. That's a lot of visits to the dentist, uh, which is, you know, worrying for Freud, obviously. Now, when Freud was in Vienna in the summer of 1931, Pickler approached this guy, Varistad Kazanzian, uh, who's Armenian-American descent. He comes from Armenia in 19, uh, 1895, and he emigrates to the United States. And Kazanzian is a hugely important figure in dentistry across the world because he develops all of the techniques for plastic surgery and for prostheses and how they're supposed to be used and how important uh, his, his role in all of dental surgery developments. I, I cannot even, like, I don't understand it when I read the journals, but it's really, he's really fantastic. Kazan, Kazanzian is approached by Pichler and he refuses, he says he doesn't want to treat Freud in the summer of 1931, but he does happen to be in Europe at that time. And he is going to various conferences and he's giving talks about prostheses and plastic surgery techniques. So he agrees to meet with Freud on the 31st of July, 1931, and on the 1st of August, the next day. Kazanjian doesn't sleep for these two, day, two whole days. He stays up the whole night with Freud in Pickler's uh, surgery, and he creates for him three prostheses, which are really, really effective. And Freud is absolutely bowled over. He writes in his diary on the 3rd of August that year, something unbelievable happened. Within a day and a half, the magician made a prosthesis, which is less intrusive and heavy than all the others and with which I could chew, talk, and smoke like before. I think it was the smoking like before that could probably caused the cancer, but you know, let's leave that out. Um, so Freud has this sort of revelatory experience with Kazanjian, and it's no wonder why, because Kazanjian's fame is established during the First World War. Uh, he joins um, the medical corps in France in 1915. He later becomes known as the miracle man of the Western Front, because what he does is he treats hundreds of soldiers who've got terrible wounds from the war, um, facial wounds, teeth, jaw wounds, he creates prostheses for them, lots of plastic surgery, and he develops whole new techniques for the treatment of war wounds, war injuries, and of dental issues. He is awarded uh, various honors by most of the Western allies. He is lauded uh, in France and in the UK. Um, and as the previous slide showed, he goes back to Harvard and he becomes the professor of clinical oral surgery at Harvard, 1922 to 41, and the very first professor of plastic surgery at Harvard, 1941 to 1947. Now, one of the other reasons why I find Kazanjian really interesting is that he is of Armenian descent. Um, he grows up, first of all, in sort of the Turkish Ottoman borders of Armenia, 
but then flees to France in 1895 and then to America later that year. And of all places, and how unlikely it might be, Kazanjian lives or lived in Worcester, Massachusetts. That's where he sets up shop. That's the first place he has a practice. It is very unlikely. Perhaps Bishop is just playing with the notions of things. But I think in this poem about going to the dentists, I think this poem about female child psychology, which could connect obviously to Freud and to Jung, given that Freud has all of these dental issues and the man who is the miracle man of the Western Front, for whom the war was so important, for whom the war was on, that he is the person who comes from Worcester, Massachusetts as well. So that's, I'm gonna leave it there because I know we're gonna have technical issues perhaps in the next few papers, but I think there's something going on in Worcester, Massachusetts, in the poem that Bishop has created and in her connections of Kazanjian, Freud, Jung, psychoanalysis and dentistry. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Really a, a new way to think about the poem, which I'm going to have to begin to think about now. Uh, really appreciate that, Phil. Uh, okay, uh, uh, let's just move on and we'll save the questions and the discussion for the end of uh, the hour. Um, I'm going to check in with Paula and see what she thinks. Uh, what do you think, Paula? So to make mothers worse, because I am still in the Sahara Hotel, um, there's a music concert that's been going on the past three days, even though it's 10.30 a.m. here, it's still going on. <laughs> started again for today so and it's pretty loud behind me so um in addition to the um we'll see how this goes okay um so i was looking at the question of theodicy within uh loyal's work and um, i'm going to start off by kind of giving an overview of the problem of theodicy and a couple of the major models um, that have been used to approach that. And then from there, uh, look at how Loyal addresses this question, if he does at all. Um, if I start to go over, just cut me off. Um, I scaled this down a bit to meet the time frame, but I think it may still be a little lengthy. So I will go ahead and start with it. Uh, Kenneth Surin defines the Odyssey in this very straightforward manner. Quote, theodicy in its classical form requires the adherence of a, theist, of a theistic faith to reconcile the existence of an omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect God with the existence of evil. While there have been countless versions of how to resolve this seemingly inherent contradiction, one of the most interesting solutions has been was provided historically by the philosopher Leibniz. Here I'll refer to Henry Sherman's beautifully put explanation of how Leibniz, uh, or Leibniz constructs his solution. In his theodicy, uh, Leibniz gives a paradigm example of what I'm calling a strong theodicy. He argues that the perfection of God's nature entails that he create the best. It follows, I think, that the actual world is that this actual world is the best possible world. Since the world God has in fact actualized contains evil, Leibniz argues that every evil, no matter how insignificant or horrendous, uh, which the actual world contains, is a necessary condition for its being the best possible world. Remove even one insignificant evil, the resulting world will be a different world and it will be less than the best. Thus God's reason for permitting evil is his desire to create the best. God, Leibniz argues, even has an obligation to permit the best. I chose this uh, paraphrase by Sherman of Leibniz's theology or theological rendering of theodicy because Leibniz represents one of the more extreme versions of how to reconcile the problem of dualism, 
of a good God with a sometimes not so good and possibly even evil world. To state that God must permit evil to exist in order for the best possible world to come into existence, but not come into existence in some futuristic version of perfection, but rather to exist now in this form as already the best possible version of itself, seems to be a rather extreme or radical assertion when we pause and consider just how low the depths of evil can go. It also raises other questions such as, what about ontological evil? What Sherman uh, means by strong theodicy, uh, this use of the term strong is clear when he contrasts it against what he terms as weak theodicy, which he explains as a conception of God's power that entails that there is no best that God can do. Thus, according to the weak theodicist, uh, for any possible world that God is able to actualize, there will always be a better possible world that which God is able to actualize. Given this view of divine power, it's not possible for God to have a morally sufficient reason for permitting the evils which occur. In the first version following Leibniz, that of a strong theodicy, God has a justifiable reason for permitting evil because it's already the best possible world. And this seems to present a kind of resolution to the problem of why evil is permitted. In the second version of theodicy, the weak theodicy, God holds no justifiable moral reason for allowing evil, and thus um, God's own sense of morality is put on trial, and that too becomes obviously problematic, or, or, uh, or for some, it may hold no qualms with putting God on trial uh, for a presupposed moral justification or lack thereof. You may notice that thus far I've stayed upon the word evil, and I've not used the word suffering. But if I were to introduce the word suffering into the equation, what then would change in how theodicy is viewed and talked about, if anything were to change at all? In fact, uh, quite often when theodicy is written about, uh, or the topics broached in some form, the words evil and suffering are often used interchangeably in the dialogue, and yet the words clearly are not the same. If we turn to another version of theodicy, that of the theologian John Hick, then we find that the word suffering is more frequently interjected into the conversation. And in fact, it could be argued that the word suffering functions as a main focal point in John Hick's theological answer to the problem of theodicy. As Mark Scott pointed out, John Hick transformed the shape of thinking about a sea in contemporary philosophical theology with his conception of the world as a value of soul making. Suffering, he argues, enables our development as spiritually and morally mature persons. Without suffering, we could not cultivate virtue and, and character. God designs the world, therefore, not to shield us from hardships, but to facilitate our progress towards perfection through constant encounters with dangers, difficulties, and misfortunes. Um, while many scholars have associated Hick's theodicy um, with a classical form, Scott argues that um, there's uh, that that, um, that Hick actually uh, diverges from Augustine's view of evil, and I'll just kind of skip here for the sake of time and, and briefly kind of state that difference. So, in the Augustine theodicy. Um, one is not moving toward a state of perfection uh, through suffering. But with John Hick's version, with this idea of value and the making of the soul, one is moving toward a new state of perfection. And it takes uh, suffering in order to reach that. So um, for the sake of time here, I'm going to move to the part about Lowell. So if we were to hold, um, let me go back. So within all these forms of theodicy, um, this brings us to a question about where it all in the Pedics of Robert Lowell does Lowell himself confront the problem of theodicy? Uh, and maybe there should even be a question asked prior to this, that of why does a poet, someone who's not a theologian or a philosopher, um, not a secular philosopher nor a religious philosopher, even care to include the Odyssey in his poetics. I suppose one retort could be, well, why not? Why shouldn't a poet speak of theodicy and theology? Um, but still, it seems to stand out as a question 
of why Loyal would want to bring the problem of theodicy into his poetics, again, if he does at all. So if we were to hold Loyal up to a poet like T.S. Eliot, whose religious sentiments are much clearer to discern theologically, um, it is, after all, not hard to follow the Augustinian lines that are so apparent in Eliot, for example, in Four Quartets, that we perhaps say that while Eliot is a poet theologian, Lowell is probably more classifiable as a poet skeptic, but the kind of skeptic that never shakes loose his puritanical New England past and doesn't seem to entirely want to shake loose from them either. Um, there's also, of course, Lowell's brief flirtation and his moment of conversion to Catholicism, and then sub subsequently his turning away from Catholicism. But even Lowell's plunge toward the secular never feels entirely secular. Suffering and evil both are present in Lowell's poems. The suffering often takes one of two forms. It's either a psychological form of suffering through discussion of mental illness or that of physicality and carnal natures of suffering within the body itself or exhibited, or really, I guess we could pose the third one exhibited throughout history. Uh, it may not always be the poet's own body that his poems observe in a condition of suffering. Um, for example, if we were to look at poems such as at Bible House, we see how the poem demonstrates um, six deep-seated aspects of Lowell's religious poetry prior to life studies. We find in the poem at a Bible house, hypocrisy, revolt, institutional religion as artifice, uh, genealogy, moral and metaphysical um, unification. Uh, the elements of democracy uh, so, uh, starts out with at a Bible house where smoking is forbidden by the prophet's law, I saw you weary, bedridden, gone in the kidneys, raw onions and a louse, twitched on the sheet before. Uh, palsy if you are at night, God rooted, hard. You spoke whistling, gristle words, half inaudible to us. A raw boned burns, a raw boned birds migrating from the smoke of cities of a gull perched on the redwood, thrusting short all shades. 300 feet of love where the Pacific heaves the taproot, wise above man's wisdom food, squeezed from down here standing. It is all a moment the trees grow earthward, no good nor evil, hopes nor fears, repulsion nor desire, earth, water, air, or fire will serve to stay the fall. The elements of hypocrisy the poem represent are obvious. The law presumably sanctioned by divine authority is really nothing more than a social moray, a health restriction at best. While the Mennonite has upheld the divine law of not, spoken, of not smoking, the poem is ambiguous enough to imply that he's indulged in heavy bouts of drinking, perhaps causing the, the kidneys to shut down. Nonetheless, a degree of rebellion or re Exist in the Mennonite, just as the propensity to rebel against some code, restriction, or law exists in some point in time for every individual. One, one divine law cannot cover another law, and thus the system of giving and keeping the prophet's law goes on and on. The fact that the law is a prophet's law gives it some sense of divine authority, but it also points to its being a natural. If the it, it's the law of the Mennonite community. So it's the community's own law unto itself. Uh, the affinity Loyal felt in connection though to the problem of theodicy, the theologians attempt to reconcile the nature of evil and its ontology as alongside that of a benevolent deity in the soul's ontology is a theme that we find running in the first collections of his poems prior to life studies. Uh, just a few years prior to the publication of Life Studies in 1959, uh, in 55 and 56, Loyal undertakes a prose analysis of the problem of evil. And in this prose essay, he explores a number of avenues uh, that cannot be identified as purely psychological. It's remarkably apparent that the way that Loyal struggles with the possibility that evil may be just a more or even an outgrowth of a theological problem 
such as chemical imbalances in the brain, as Lowell's own manic depression exemplified, evil could not be explained away entirely through behaviorism, but it had to have some consideration that there was an ontological possibility of evil. And we find this in his essay, Art and Evil. In Art and Evil, Lowell begins by making reference uh, to the condition of the 20th century. He describes history as earthly, and the effect of two world wars, uh, the onslaught of the Cold War, uh, the material consequences of that, saying that the Earth's surface seems to have sagged and cracked. Um, he mentions uh, everything from Hitler to Stalin's purges uh, to the nuclear war. And we also find that there's a strong sense of Manichaeism, Gnosticism, to the way that Lowell assesses this material realism of modernity. Uh, as Lowell writes, today we're looking for a darkness visible, and we know that a realistic awe of evil uh, is a valuable thing for the writer to have. In his essays, Lowell points to a history of pessimism in literature, noting that for the moderns, quote, our literary models at first were the violent Elizabethan tragedians. Um, then he moves on to talk about the French poets. He discusses the rediscovery of the classics, naming Shakespeare and Tennyson, but arguing that the value that these classics held for the modern writer uh, was simply to hunt out the wolfish and the grotesque. In Art and Evil, Lowell also mentions Eliot's After Strange God, and specifically he hones in on Eliot's passage about original sin, knowing how with Eliot, uh, Eliot's tone had somewhat tearful, somewhat a rising note of a true preacher. The passage after Strange Gods as a rather famous one in which Eliot declares that evil exists with a capital E and it can enter into any arena of human thought, even including literature. And for Eliot, calling evil synonymous with the doctrine of original sin. Um, and then in turn, naming original sin as a very real and tremendous thing. Lowell's response to Eliot's literary doctrine of original sin um, is captured in Art and Evil. And, and uh, there, Lowell calls that into question. So if original sin had lost its zeal for the modern writer, according to Lowell, uh, then what was the cause of evil and how could the modern writer seek to explain it? So Lowell uh, moves away from an Augustinian definition of evil as resulting from, e from original sin and privation, but Lowell is not willing to give up the hunt for there being some explanation for it, and perhaps even one still somewhat rooted in a theological perspective. Lowell approaches the subject by way of reference, at least to a cosmological explanation, when he writes, Quote, now one of the hopeful characteristics of our human nature is that we cannot even put up with evil for long unless it's made exciting. And we cannot put up with excitement unless it's true. All parties agree on this. But from there on, the approach is either classical or romantic. The romantic approach is that man is the victim of the gods. This is on the whole the question of Greek classical drama, a position which the imagination will never quite disown. The classical approach in man's, man's uh, abuse of God's love, this is the position on the whole of Plato and the world's religions, a position they can never quite get rid of. Both sides call on Christ. Here I'm tempted to overreach myself and address you for half a minute as a theologian and Christian apologist. I'd like to say that I see uh, being is made up of hierarchical elements, nature, man, society, angels, perhaps, and God. We see each element from time to time as good, indifferent, or bad, as black, white, or gray. The war of God and creation of classicist and romantic goes on forever. What is special about Christ is that he takes on both sides at once. So all of that quote was from his article. Uh, Lowell's, uh, for the same time, I'm going to skip mm -hmm. a part on. Oh, Paula, you're beginning. Paula, you're beginning to break up. Okay. Uh, maybe, uh, um, maybe you could. 
Yeah, so uh, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. Well, okay, so let me just kind of, well. yes. So because I am breaking up a bit, let me just summarize kind of the, the end of this. So essentially the question that I'm taking up is um, when one goes back and examines what Loyal himself wrote about the nature of evil and uh, specifically looking at his essay, Art and Evil, uh, one finds that he's not willing to relinquish the concept that evil exists, but at the same time, he's rejected the traditional Christian explanations um, that have attempted to resolve the Odyssey. So he's not in the Augustinian model uh, of seeing evil as a privation resulting from the fall or from original sin. Um, a poet like Eliot would have been much more comfortable with that. Uh, but neither is Lowell adopting a more uh, modern view, uh, such as a process theology like John Hicks, with the idea that evil results in some type of uh, suffering that leads to purification of the soul, that leads to virtue, that leads to growth, that leads the soul closer to God. So he's rejected kind of the two big theological solutions found to, in, found to theodicy. And that leaves him basically um, in the position of a skeptic, where then uh, the question is just left open to some extent. And he's rather in this no man's land of how then does one reconcile the existence of evil and suffering without turning to any of these explanations. And I'm not sure that he actually ever resolves it, but it becomes this ongoing question for him that I think fuels a lot of what's there behind um, the poetry. And so the religious skepticism is there prior to life studies. And then from life studies onward, uh, it's more of a psychological examination, but neither approaches seem to be entirely um, ta entirely satisfactory to him. So for the sake of time, I'll, I'll leave it there. And then if there are any questions at the end, thank you. Great. Well, thank you very, thank you very thank much, you. Paula. Very, very interesting indeed. Um, our next speaker is uh, Hannah Baker Saltmarsh, uh, who's going to be talking on Bullshit Eloquence, the autobiography of Elizabeth Bishop, sorry, the autobiography of Elizabeth Hardwick by Robert Lowell. Uh, Hannah, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going to read the first seven or so pages from a longer piece. Um, I think it gets into the main argument and kind of sets it up, although it doesn't use all my evidence. Bullshit Eloquence, the Autobiography of Elizabeth Hardwick by Robert Lowell. Gertrude Stein whimsically inserts herself into her strangely titled The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, comprised of the supposed dictations of Stein's romantic partner. James Merrill received the Pulitzer Prize for versifying seance transcriptions that he and his partner, David Jackson, created. Though one man's the poet, the other a presence. Robert Lowell credits the writer Elizabeth Hardwick, his former wife, as his collaborating muse, from whose intense letters he quoted and misquoted without consent. However, the resulting book, The Dolphin, and the Pulitzer it won were simply what the male poet's own hand did at Hardwick's expense. This essay departs radically from the 20th century American penchant for writers who simply play with language, anyone's, for any effect, under the guises of speaking as or speaking for another, such that Robert Lowell said to a creative writing workshop, you can say anything in a poem if you place it properly. Lowell erred in appropriating the epistolatory voice of the literary critic, novelist, and co-founder of the New York Review of Books, Hardwick, who was Lowell's second wife and ex-wife at the time Lowell composed The Dolphin. In the volume, Lowell doctored the private letters of Hardwick, troubling the fictitious nature of the Lizzie character, Lowell represented and poeticized source material from Hardwick's transatlantic letters and phone calls during the couple's most tumultuous period from the summer of 1970 to 1972. 
Nearly as soon as Lowell left his family in New York for a poetry fellowship in England, he began an affair with Lady Caroline Blackwood. Hardwick and Lowell wrote their way through their feelings, histories, and eventual divorce. As lifelong writers of letters, and out of necessity, on either side of the Atlantic, they had to break up, yearn for each other, communicate about their daughter Harriet, and discuss nearly everything by letter. Thus the Hardwick letters, which Lowell co-ops, appear to document a dissolving literary marriage the way dental records connect name and corpse. But the letter poems are Lowellized. That Lowell, who uses the Hardwick letters to shape his own grand narrative, is a famous mid-career confessional poet on the cusp of divorcing the letter writer cannot be overstated. I hope to illuminate the wild imbalance between the poet's power to tell his story and the object or other's pain of being the story. The dolphin titillates readers not only with the open coffin of Lowell's open book, but with the open coffin of Hardwick's textual corpus heir to the public, 102 private letters and postcards, plus others that are lost. Lowell cast Lizzie in the book as a comically desperate, emotionally abusive, dramatic foil to Blackwood, whom he would have a child with and marry. Though Stanley Kunitz objected to the intimately cruel and monstrously heartless use of Hardwick's voice in The Dolphin and other prominent poets, such as Tom Gunn, Donald Hall, W.H. Auden, Elizabeth Bishop, and Adrian Rich voiced similar critiques, Lowell nonetheless won the Pulitzer Prize. When Hardwick read the book and the flood of criticism in the summer of 1973, she was on the brink of suicide and wrote to Bishop that the book has hurt me as much as anything in my life. Defending Lowell's book by sifting out moral sociopolitical concerns is no longer a tenable solution to a crucial yet understudied quandary of confessional poetry. How has male privilege and artistic agency perpetuated the historic dispossession from women of their own life stories? Saskia Hamilton, who recently edited a collection of Lowell Hardwick letters from the Dolphin period, frames key moral and aesthetic questions, quote, Central to Lowell and Hardwick's exchange of letters in the 1970s into the work they made during this period is a debate about the limits of art, what moral and artistic license artists have to make use of their lives as material, end quote. From the advent of confessional poetry, writing about the self easily blurred into the subject matter of intimate others. However, Frank Bedart's quip, you can't be married to a writer and not expect to end up in their work, isn't grand permission. And Jeffrey Myers doesn't speak for every reader and wagering that most think Lowell's art was worth Hardwick's anguish. Although at times Lowell attempted to wear the voices of marginalized others, he was barely beginning during the long stretch of second wave feminism to grasp the commonplace ways in which he benefited from co-opting Hardwick's story. I concur with Adrian Rich that Lowell's bullshit eloquence in The Dolphin versifies and fictionalizes a woman and attempts to reduce or dominate her. I concur with Elizabeth Bishop, who told Lowell in angst-ridden italics, art just isn't worth that much. Bishop clarified it was a question of not only exploitation or consent, but also a question of authenticity, since Lowell revised Hardwick's words. Ultimately, Lowell disregarded Hardwick's emotional property, Hardwick's rights to her own privacy and pain. Hardwick, ever the literary critic, schooled the publisher Richard Giro, contextualizing Lowell's appropriation, quote, I know of no other instance in literature where a person is exploited in a supposedly creative act under his own name in his own lifetime, end quote. Lowell perpetuated many wrong impressions in the book and omitted major narrative threads, including Hardwick's willingness to divorce and amicability. Harriet Lowell recalls her mother's happiness and literary vibrancy during her parents' divorce. None of this liberation comes through in Lowell's poems, which simply travesty Hardwick's experience. Rereading Lowell and Hardwick now in 2021, in the wake of Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and Own Stories, Rich's iconic American Poetry Review article of 1973 gains new resonance. Rich lambasted Lowell for the aggrandized and merciless masculinity in the book, an exemplar of the dead end destructiveness that masculine privilege has built for itself into all institutions. Nick Halpern's observation, today we are obsessed not with marriage so much as with malignant male narcissists and male sociopaths, situates a newfound interest in the Hardwick Lowell letters, confessional poetry, and the nexus with authorial agency. 
As Toni Morrison has noted, otherness that remains free of categories of worth or rank are difficult to come by. Master narratives stick, which is why Chimamande Ngozi Adichie argues that usurping another person or a people's story is perpetual dispossession. Quote, power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person, end quote. Given the literary status of Lowell and the genre of confessional poetry he birthed with life studies, Lowell's version of Hardwick as Lizzie suggests the impact of misogyny in literary marriages and milieus. The specific poems in The Dolphin that draw from Hardwick's text or voice, number 13, some of which are sonnet sequences and include During a Transatlantic Call, Exorcism, Doubt, The Friend, In the Mail, Hospital Two, Sections, Voices and Letter, Artist Model, Marriage, Sections, Gruff, Green Sore and Letter, Records, Communication, Old Snapshot from Venice, 1952, Fox Fur and Leaving America for England. However, other poems reference what appear to be lost letters. Beyond the specific lines lifted and or revised from Hardwick is the question, to what end does Lowell appropriate Hardwick's voice? The Lizzie character performs a perfunctory literary role in a misogynistic love triangle of one man, two women, the common novel plot. Juxtaposed to the Lizzie persona appearing in the pages of The Dolphin is Blackwood, beautiful, pregnant, literary, titled, and 15 years, Lowell's Jr. Lizzie is compared to the pure witchery bitchery of childish winters. She is melodrama with her stiletto heel, dancing bullet wounds in the parquet and castigating the poet with lines like, you can't carry your talent with you like a suitcase. Hardwick's emotional and literary power is reduced to the amorphous torture shrieks of the female hysteric across a fuzzy transatlantic phone line. The poet has had so much, 100 words a minute, piercing and thrilling of Hardwick's rapier voice. From his end of the phone, her intense cadence morphs to bathos. By contrast, Blackwood is transformed into an elegant, intelligent, sensuous dolphin who guides the poet by surprise. Blackwood is depicted as a desiring subject and as a writer akin to Racine, the man of craft. Excitedly, the poet claims, after 50, so much joy has come, I hardly want to hide my nakedness, finding that new love is rebirth. While Blackwood carries Lowell's son in a second chance at family and personal happiness, Lizzie exacerbates the poet's guilt and self-hatred, reminding him of the flawless daughter he's abandoned and can't appease with gifts or of the love he's ruined. The gift Lizzie offers the poet at Christmas is a reprimand of the poet's narcissism, a book with the inscription, why don't you lose yourself and write a play about the fall of Japan. A perversely incriminating mother destroyer figure in exorcism, the Lizzie persona is like a mean inner critic the poet wishes to purge, yet he is drawn back to Lizzie the inner mother wife voice of incriminating defeatism and masochism. She is a container for the poet's self-flagellations, past suffering and romantic vacillations. The poet recalls Lizzie's letters as if Hardwick were there gesticulating, you point your finger what you love you are. Lizzie indicates that the poet will be changed for the worse by Blackwood. Morally, he would be corrupted, she thought, by a selfish, alcoholic, depressed aristocrat who solves her problems by having more babies. The poem, however, ironically suggests that in the arms of Lizzie, the poet would do even worse, diminished to a child yelled at by his righteous mother. Hardwick's letters culminate in a nefarious visceral presence, bridal fury showing white teeth, parading an invisible link male. Several poems changed Hardwick's meaning in ways that indicate Lowell's misuse of poetic power. For example, in a letter, Hardwick states, I don't entirely wish you well, far from it, of course, but leads the paragraph off with, dearest, do take care, nothing is worth destroying yourself, and wishes him good luck, happiness, and what he wants. She implies that almost all of her wants the best for him, though some small part of her is embittered and doesn't entirely want the best for him. In marriage, Lowell writes, words of a moment's menace stay for life, not that I wish you entirely well, far from it. In this version, Lizzie hopes that Lowell is not completely well, possibly even suffering. The emphasis makes Lizzie look ruthless, vapid, like a soap opera character who wants to look hotter, happier than her ex, and heartless, as if she's relishing Shade and Freud. In another poem, Lowell inserts a rude, so what? 
into Hardwick's letter text and removes the nuances of subject matter and context. You say I wrote H isn't interested in the thing happening to you now, so what? In the letter, Lowell references, Hardwick explains that teenagers generally aren't that interested in their parents, implying that Harriet doesn't say much about her father's new marriage or child. And then mentions that Adrienne Rich says her kids don't talk to her about their father who committed suicide. Later in the letter, Hardwick clarifies that she does talk lovingly about him to Harriet and is no longer bitter, but agrees with Lowell that his trip to visit them for a brief time isn't worth his exhaustion. The poem records comes closest to portraying empathy for Hardwick and Harriet because we see Lizzie saying she'd rather deal with the difficult truths than be lied to, that she prefers the poet's heartbreaking letters to his unreal ones that string her along. However, this poem wraps up by floating that Lizzie thinks he'll never be a good romantic partner. His mysterious carelessness and visions of unreality signify destructiveness for anyone involved. The poem shifts the gaze from the family's loss to the poet's existential crisis and psychological woundedness from her record of pain to his track record in love. I'm gonna stop there because of time. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. Okay, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, hear from uh, Adam uh, Beardsworth, uh, who's going to uh, speak about future conditional confessional poetry and national security affect. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> and thanks to uh, Steve for, for putting all of this together. Um, in the early Cold War period, the dual threats of nuclear annihilation and communist infiltration were marshaled by the US government to establish what Joseph Masco calls a climate of national security affect. In this talk, I'll consider confessional poetry as a response to that climate, which rendered private anxiety a matter of national security. And I'm just going to share my screen here. Give me one moment to see if I can make that work. There you go. That should be OK. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm a little under the weather today, so pardon my voice. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, US, the exacerbation of containment and anxiety uh, uh, were frequently found in the same rhetorical packages. State-run organizations such as the Federal Civil Defense Administration and the Atomic Energy Commission launched public relations campaigns that conflated the risks of nuclear proliferation with visions of utopian atomic futures, all in the name of regulating anxiety and normalizing a burgeoning atomic industry, whose long-term impact on both the domestic population and the physical environment had yet to be fully understood. This uncertain political climate by no means went unprotested by poets, radical voices such as that of Allen Ginsberg, who famously uh, decried America, fuck you with your atom bomb, declared the visceral contempt many Americans felt when faced with the prospect of nuclear war. However, it was the less overtly political voices of confessional poets, such as uh, Berryman or Lowell, Sylvia Plath, Anne Sexton, and others that registered the impact of the affective climate on individual psyches. Filled with suspicion, surveillance, hysteria, and witch hunts, the early Cold War placed alarming pressures on US citizens. For poets such as Lowell and Berryman, who I'll focus on in this talk, the confessional mode not only helped keep their work below the radar of state surveillance, it also allowed them to expose a link between private anxiety and suffering and the politics of the future conditional, where disaster looms perpetually on the horizon. Anxiety has been a powerful and pervasive tool in the United States' political arsenal, at least since the early Cold War. The antecedents of today's anxiety-inducing media spectacles, from Fox News to Shark Week or pharmaceutical advertisements to self-help sensations, have roots in the naturalizing campaigns of the Atomic Energy Commission and Civil Defense. These Cold War campaigns were deployed to contain the profound uncertainty born in tandem with the United States' development of atomic and later hydrogen bombs, and to control fears of communist invasion. While the threat of nuclear war was real, it also provided an unprecedented political opportunity, one where fear of an uncertain future could be packaged, marketed, and regulated as a means of managing domestic populations. 
The origin of American affective politics can be traced to a National Security Council policy document submitted to then President Harry Truman in 1950. Known as NSC 68, the document outlined far-reaching measures to ensure that the United States would emerge victorious in its standoff with the Soviet Union. While the document was extensive, it suggested in part that American citizens could be mobilized against the Soviet menace if the government were to foster a climate of fear and uncertainty. As Joseph Masco contends, after the presentation <coughs> of NSC 68, the White House recognized that, quote, nuclear fear was to be not only the basis of American military power, but also a means of installing a new normative reality in the United States, one that could consolidate political power at the federal level by reaching into the internal lives of citizens. In other words, for those uh, living in an era where fear manifests itself as a political ontology, threat is not just media hysteria, it is a, a felt quality, independent of any particular instance of itself, as Brian Masumi says. So from the early Cold War period uh, forward, as Masco contends, the U.S. has drawn on the destructive capacities of nuclear weapons to focus social energies, unlock resources, and build things by using nuclear fear as a coordinating principle for U.S. institutions, citizen-state relations, and geopolitics alike. As such, national security affect is, quote, a special kind of collective experience one that is central to enabling the technological and administrative capacities of the security state, where infrastructures, affective, imaginative, and material are linked in the production of American power, creating an unprecedented global projection of American fears and desires in the name of existential defense. So confessional poetry has seldom been seen as responsive uh, or to political turmoil. For instance, in the New American Poetry of Engagement, Anne Keniston and Jeffrey Gray's 2012 anthology of 21st century political poetry, the editors somewhat ironically employ Lowell's late poem epilogue as their epigraph. In that poem, Lowell laments how difficult it is, as a witness to history, to simply, quote, say what happened. According to Keniston and Gray, this question was quote, promoted by Lowell, by what Lowell saw, <clears throat> excuse me, as the direction of his own poetry. At the end of his career, he worried that his poems had become not the work of imagination and technique, but rather mere snapshots, lured, rapid, garish, grouped, heightened from life, yet paralyzed by fact, end quote. For Keniston and Gray, the, quote, contradictory obligations of truth-telling, the need both to keep faith with what has occurred and to transform or transcend it, end quote, is ultimately compromised by Lowell's indebtedness to the confessional mode. As they write in their instruction, uh, sorry, in their introduction, American poems after the mid-century, while reacting against the erudition and difficulty of the modernists, did so in a way that turned even more emphatically away from the political. The confessional poetry of Robert Lowell, Sylvia Plath, Anne Sexton, and others was explicitly and candidly personal." End quote. So what Keniston and Gray are perhaps missing here is that Lowell's inability to transcend snapshots of lured and garish American life is in fact the enactment of a struggle that is at once personal and political, where an individual's fight to voice meaningful, meaningful critiques of pervasive, often insidious, and frequently naturalized ideological forces. By examining the self in its Cold War context, Lowell, along with several other confessional poets, attempts to understand the relationship between personal wounds and the perpetual trauma of a politics based at once on threat and containment of that threat. The anxiety produced by national security affect is what poets such as Berryman and Lowell most overtly register in their works. Modeled on Whitman's Song of Myself, Berryman's 385 poem opus, The Dream Songs, takes to heart Whitman's notion that poetry must radiate from both body and soul. Like Whitman, Berryman sees the poet as arbiter of affective relations insofar as affect uh, can be understood as a gradient of bodily capacity, a supplemental incrementalism of ever-modulating force relations that rises and falls not only along various rhythms and modalities of encounter, but also through the troughs and sieves of sensation and sensibility. And I'm taking that from uh, Siegworth and Gregg's introduction to the affect studies reader. So whereas Whitman's affective registers tended towards feelings of optimism and democratic potential, 
Berryman's dream songs register the anxiety or conflict or panic or doubt of the early nuclear age. As he famously proclaims in song 366, these songs are not meant to be understood, you understand, they are only meant to terrify and comfort. And this tension between terror and comfort evokes the poles of national security affect that pit the individual between the domestic comforts of Cold War containment and the ever-present possibility of disaster that was sold as a likely outcome of a failure to conform to the emergent neoliberal discourses of the U.S. So this feeling of being pitted between anxiety and containment recurs in many dream songs. Song 8, for example, features Henry lying prostrate on an examination bench while nameless agents physically dismantle him. Even as, even as these agents, as Berryman writes, quote, weakened all his eyes and stuck burning thumbs into his ears and shook his hand like a notch, end quote, the weather outside always remains, quote, very fine over the course of the interrogation. The contrast between the fine weather outside and the persecution inside for Berryman evokes the contrast between political containment and the personal suffering produced by affective politics. The fractured syntax and opaque, often paratactic imagery of the dream songs enhances their, enhances their attempts to assert anxiety and discomfort and pain as affective registers, while simultaneously implying the difficulty of voicing public protest. As in Song 23, where Henry literally chokes on his own words as he tries to praise the inauguration of Dwight Eisenhower, and he writes, this is the lay of Ike, here's to the glory of the great white, this Auk, who has been running uh, uh, things in recent, ah, he can't get the words out, so. Poems such as this one read as though Henry is struggling to speak clearly, but either cannot quite swallow the rhetoric or is forced into, into silence by his inquisitors. His language, in other words, fails to adequately register the affective states produced by events that are at once traumatic and repressive. And this is especially the case in one of Berryman's few poems that addresses um, nuclear brinksmanship directly. In Song 225, he writes, Madness and booze, madness and booze, Witchell can tell who preceded whose, What chicken walked out on what egg, I can tell which am which oblong, Corroborate, Los Alamos, we read you, wrong, I put up my radar and beg. So in this typically chaotic stanza, Berryman asks Los Alamos to corroborate for him whether madness leads to alcoholism or vice versa. The invocation of Los Alamos appears to implicate the home of the Manhattan Project and birthplace of the atomic bomb within this otherwise bizarre chicken versus egg query. Los Alamos, in other words, answers in Berryman's frenetic imagination, which came first because it's the traumatic source of anxiety that led to the breakdown, whether initially psychological or alcoholic. So Berryman appears to recognize how the production of affect not only has psychological, a psychological impact, the anxiety it causes is its own powerful form of containment, keeping the subject focused on personal recovery rather than political action. So by enacting both the physical and psychological conditions of uncertainty, the poem, like many of the dream songs, bears witness to the struggles born of living in a climate of biopolitical management. Lowell wrote of the psychological impact of national security affect in somewhat more straightforward terms. In poems such as Fall 1961, for instance, he describes the estrangement he feels as a subject during a time of nuclear anxiety. Poem reads, all autumn the chafe and jar of nuclear war, we have talked our extinction to death, I swim like a minnow behind my studio window. Too powerless to shatter the glass that contains him, Lowell's minnow swims aimlessly as it waits to be preyed upon. The image of the minnow as a sort of nervous bait fish separated from its school implies that Lowell is not alone in his anxiety. Indeed, if the state, as Lowell says, is a diver under a glass bell, then the minnows are the powerless subjects contained within its perimeter. So this feeling of helplessness registers as a complaint against the state's desire to contain and render docile political dissent. It suggests Lowell's understanding that fear of impending catastrophe uh, both conditions an atmosphere of docility and licenses preemptive political action, leaving Lowell feeling helpless and anxious, which he makes clear in the poem's assert assertion that a father is no shield for his child. Other Lowell poems, including several that do not speak directly to the political situation, still position the speaker as a subject struggling against a biopolitical regime. 
Like Berryman, many of, the, uh, of these poems convey scenes of physical or psychological wounding. In famous poems such as Skunk Hour, for instance, Lowell Speaker, unable to locate himself in post-war consumer culture, hears his, quote, ill spirit sob in each blood cell, as if my hand were at its throat. In Waking in the Blue, <clears throat> he contemplates his own shaky future as it grows familiar in the pinched indigenous face faces of these thoroughbred mental cases. As in his conclusion to Home After Three Months Away, where he laments that cured, he is frizzled, stale, and small, Lowell's early Cold War poems contemplate the fraught relationship between uh, affective management and American individualism. So by highlighting his own fear, confusion, and sense of being contained like a minnow, Lowell not only articulates his own nuclear weariness, he takes that notion a step farther by suggesting that being caught between fear and the promise of a bright atomic future is a politicized means of managing subjects on the level of affect. For Lowell, it's not simply the spirit that is ill, rather the season's ill too, suggesting a correlation between sick selves and a sick culture. His psychological and institutional metaphors suggest not only that the uncertainty generated by a politics of threat has impacted his identity, but that the path to psychological health is an institutional one aimed at remaking his fractured self in more compliant terms. In July in Washington, uh, from For the Union Dead, Lowell explicitly suggests that this compliance is not willful. Rather, it registers on the level of affective management. The poem sounds like a lament for the lack of leadership in Washington, while ironically acknowledging that, quote, we cannot name their names or number their dates, circle on circle, like rings on a tree. Here, Lowell seems to be playing on the Cold War imperative, demanded by agencies such as the House and American Activities Committee, that true Americans will name those who they suspect of unpatriotic activity or affiliation. By refusing to name the names of America's political elite, Lowell implies that openly criticizing his own government uh, could open him up to charges of unpatriotic behavior. So just to kind of wrap up quickly in, in the interest of, of time, let's say that for confessional poets such as Berryman and Lowell, Identifying affective politics in an era of surveillance meant showing the impact of a politics of promise and panic on American subjects, instead of decrying overtly the injustice of political institutions, as poets perhaps like Ginsburg or Corso or Lavertov or others did. So while not always outwardly political, their work testifies to the trauma of living beneath the specter of nuclear destruction. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank all four uh, speakers for really interesting and insightful, illuminating uh, uh, papers uh, about uh, uh, Lowell Bishop, uh, Hardwick, and Berryman. Um, I, one thing I draw from it is Lowell's mixed legacy that uh, probably we'll be contending with for a long time to come. And then a second one is the psychological and affective focus of uh, the writers that uh, we've been hearing about today and, uh, and how that um, uh, plays out in our reception of them as well. Um, I, I want to open the floor to uh, comments, questions, and discussion. Uh, who, who would like to uh, say something to uh, one of our four speakers. Oh, okay, Adam, go ahead. Okay. Okay. And don't, don't use the hand icon because I never notice it. Uh, just best thing to do is just plunge in, honestly, or raise your, raise your finger. All right. uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought Adam wanted to say something. Oh, no, I can't. Yeah, sure. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah, sure. I just, I've got uh, just these were great. Um, Philip, just a, more of a comment or just a quick question. I was just thinking about the repetition and return um, cycle in in Bishop's poem that you pointed out. Do you think mm -hmm. she's playing at all with Freud's Fort Da here? The kind of you know the gone there game that uh, of loss of the parents and of control of parents. I don't know if that's relevant, but perhaps it speaks to uh, to the connections you're looking for here. Yeah, I think she is. I, you know, and as Marcel pointed out to me in the sort of private chat, 
you know, Bishop knows her Freud. You know, she's, she's not only does she know psychoanalysis because she's been through it, she's read all of Freud, she's read the biographies. So she like, I, I always think the Bishop is playing with us a little bit. Uh, and, you know, we think we get her, but actually I think there's other layers where she wants us eventually to find ourselves. And I don't think we have yet. So I definitely think, yes, she's definitely doing that. Um, uh, and I just think, you know, the more you scratch the surface with Bishop, the more there is to find. You know, this is the same collection, uh, in the waiting room is the same collection as the Moose. She spends 26 years putting that together. So, you know, there's a, there's a kind of, that, that sort of uh, thick kind of personal and political American histories that she builds into her poetry is, is, is immense. Yeah. Yeah, it's really great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Thank you. And uh, Frank, uh, you, yeah. you say something. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'd like to sort of pick up and borrow Adam's emphasis on affect and go up back to Hannah's talk and to uh, the dolphin, but more in my own reading to it is the affect on me <laughs> uh, this summer and reading the um, Saskia Hamilton uh, edition, not simply of the poems, I'm not getting the poems so much, but reading the letters themselves that are assembled. And I read that in a very concentrated way, uh, starting every morning early, about three or four, when I usually wake up to work for as many hours as I could with one eye, because I have eye problems. And I found the poems, the, the letters immensely moving and giving a kind of closeness to Lowell and to Hardwick that I'd never had before. You know, it was really a sense of uh, intimacy, <laughs> uh, which it is obviously in reading the uh, two letters. And naturally, Lowell is an SOB. Uh, no problem with that. Bullshit, eloquence, he's an asshole, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and incompetent and feckless and letting other people do things for himself and not replying when he should and about this and Hardwick continually writing about, well, with this, can you get it back to here and I'll send you the letter and this and all that. He's absolutely helpless. So when, when can, one can condemn Lowell from A to Z. <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> uh, my responsiveness, uh, just a personal subjective one, uh, was being extraordinarily moved by the whole um, sequence of letters and uh, and enormous admiration for Hardwick. I, I'm into this uh, uh, just as much as one wants to say he's an asshole. She's in, incredible. If you want to psychoanalyze her as uh, dependent this or that or the other, okay. But just as affect <laughs> of the movingness uh, and in this duo of this, you know, feckless guy, et cetera. But it's also, uh, you know, to use a corny word, a love story. <laughs> and as he uh, comically refers to it, one man and two women. So there's also, a, 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 there's also a, a sense I have of Lowell having to have a woman to live with uh, and not wanting in some ways to that you can hardly imagine Lowell saying, oh God, you know, I've been married enough for a while. I, why don't I screw around with some women, have myself a nice life? He, he this sense of uh, attachment uh, that Lowell has uh, is, is so strong. Um, and so there's a, a, as I say, but there was sort of improvising this, this, that, and the other, this all has to do with my feelingsness of responsiveness. <laughs> And I don't care, well, uh, yeah, bullshit, eloquence, okay, but, you know, we're, we're kind of tired of, you know, the label. Sure, okay. Uh, and one may come back, and, you know, as I'm doing and reading also the, the earlier version of the uh, letters which uh, uh, Hamilton gives, the first version, and so on. Uh, so I... I I'm less inclined to make judgments as simply respond emotionally. <laughs> so uh, that's why I wanted to pick up the uh, affect word and borrow it for a bit. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I just want to respond really quickly, but I had a very similar experience of, of reading 
the letters um, over and over again and having all kinds of emotional reactions. Yeah. And I feel like when I wrote this essay, it was fueled by like rage and passion and all these things, but it is a love story. Um, and there's some misogyny mixed in, but yeah, I feel in intensely attached to their stories. And I feel like I discovered Hardwick through Lowell and I guess some people do, but, um, but yeah, I really love her work, um, particularly seduction and betrayal. Um, but thanks for sharing that. The letters are definitely a gift and I'm happy that they're out. Um, Marion, I wonder uh, if you would want to say anything. If... Yeah, <laughs> that's how I want to hear your, your contribution to this discussion. Uh, uh, you need to turn on your... Uh... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great. So, yeah, yeah. I always find it very difficult to react and to I I I have to mull things over before I can <laughs> really react to uh, to uh, to what I've heard. But I was really interested in uh, in what Hannah uh, said because we were talking about uh, Elizabeth Hartwick uh, yesterday, and I didn't know that uh, Kathy Curtis's biography of uh, Elizabeth Hartwick. Hartwick will be out on on the 16th uh, so I'm looking forward to reading uh, that and uh, probably uh, then uh, kick myself in the head or something if that is physically uh, possible <laughs> because <laughs> of the things I said about her yesterday but I um, because I then described her as a kind of catty uh, woman just like uh, Caroline Kaiser is uh, obviously um, but um, so yeah, I'm 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 happy to have heard a lot about her from from you, Hannah. And I don't have a question at the moment. I'm just looking forward to getting to know Elizabeth Hartwick uh, better because I've always been interested in um, the wives of the men who were so much more famous uh, than the wives because of all kinds of reasons, just like, for instance, indeed, Isabella Gardner, uh, whose biography I wrote, but also think about uh, Caroline Gordon, Alan Tate's um, first and second wife. Um, and, and well, we could go on. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Alfred Kaysen's um, wife, the novelist. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to see that this is uh, shifting. That's that's what I can say. Yeah. Well, I'll do I my think, best to help. Yeah, I think I think that's important, and I've been I've been uh, interested in uh, life writing scholarship uh, recently, which I've just discovered, and uh, uh, the idea of collaborative um, uh, creativity is really becoming a more and more important concept uh, for me. Uh, uh, you know, through Lowell, but through other writers as well. I could just add uh, Elliot's wife, Vivian, wrote a couple of the very best lines in The Wasteland and she doesn't get credit for that. And I think that's very that's a very uh, common uh, phenomenon, which my wife, Risa Axelrod, introduced me to that, uh, you know, decades and decades ago. Um, uh, uh, Adam quoted, why not say what happened? One of Lowell's most famous lines from one of his most famous poems. And of course, Elizabeth Hardwick sent that to him and he just appropriated it without, you know, without a footnote or without acknowledgement in any way. And also, um, uh, Adam also showed us, we are like a lot of wild spiders crying together, but without tears in fall 1961. And Lowell in one of his, maybe now lost interviews, but, you know, I saw it, uh, attributed that line to Harriet. So, so uh, you know, the degree to which his daughter and his uh, partner uh, helped compose his, uh, his uh, oeuvre is significant. Another example is um, in the memoirs, which um, Greg Kosk and I are publishing next uh, year, uh, she, Elizabeth Hardwick, thoroughly edited one of the uh, memoirs, uh, one of the chapters of his childhood memoir, maybe a second, I can't remember, but I'm remembering the one. And he adopted, I would say, maybe 60% of her suggestions. and. Uh, and not 40%. And actually, I thought he adopted the ones that were stronger and uh, left alone the ones that uh, didn't work uh, as well. But, um, and then there's somebody else's uh, handwriting, also unidentified. It could be Robert Giroux, but Robert Giroux left 
Lowell's poetry completely alone. He destroyed the prose, but he, he had such respect for poetry, he didn't really touch it. So I don't think it probably was Robert Giroux, some poet friend or other. Uh, and uh, so that's a collaborative work and uh, editors always play some kind of role in copy editors and uh, other editors. So um, I don't know what that has to do with anything really, but um, uh, it's just another context to in, in, in terms of this, in terms of this whole thing, uh, sort of folding in together, I was astonished just now after Marion spoke. I, I sort of Googled Isabella Gardner, and I didn't realize that the opening sentence reads: "Born in Newton, Massachusetts, poet and actress Isabella Gardner was the cousin of poet Robert Lowell." And and I had no idea that there would be a con. You know, like at Marion, you spoke about Gardner yesterday. You just mentioned her. And here we are at a Lowell panel, and and bingo. Uh, uh, the, the only thing that was missing there was that it wasn't uh, born in Worcester, Massachusetts. You know, I suppose <laughs> that would have been the, but that would have been asking too much for the for the cherry on top of the ice cream sundae. But still, that that Gardner's linked with um, with Lowell here seems perfectly appropriate to really what has been a wonderful panel. I just want to make sure I just say to everybody, thank you very much. And thank you, Steve, for putting this together. Oh, you're welcome. And I want to thank the four, well, thanks. Uh, but I want to thank the four speakers for really amazingly um, uh, stimulating and interesting and illuminating papers. It's now 11.30, so those of you who need to go somewhere else, feel free and uh, God bless. And But if people want to stick around for a little bit longer and uh, continue our conversation, uh, sure, let's do it. Um, Anyone else want to uh, want to say something? <clears throat> yeah, Adam. I could just say something briefly. Um, Hannah, I really in enjoyed your talk, and uh, it's certainly you know important work right now and necessary work as well. And uh, as I was <laughs> kind of reading my own paper, I started thinking of of the many many instances in the dream songs, for instance, where Berryman uses his own uh, relationships, his own uh, wife, two second and third wives primarily. Uh, in often ways that are disparaging or, you know, inappropriate. And I wonder if you have any uh, inclination or if you've thought at all about looking for similar um, uh, elements in other work by confessional poets. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I really enjoyed your paper so much. Um, thank you for sharing it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think part of it is like, yes, the confessional poets were sort of opportunistic and using like their sexual lives and romantic lives in their poetry. But I also do think it says something about like the literary milieu and like society they're writing into that that was kind of juicy and like titillating. And so um, I want to, I got like really angry writing this particular essay and I needed to pull back a little bit. But, um, but I do think it's not so much just the poets, but I think they are like products of their society. Um, but I have, yeah, become more interested in like going back to Elizabeth Bishop and Adrienne Rich and kind of reading like from women poets of that time period and, and just kind of absorbing myself in their work. But you're right, like Berryman definitely does some of the same things. And of course he and Lowell were famously rivals uh, for, for attention and literary popularity. Um, but thanks for that comment. I think that uh, confessional poetry, or maybe just poetry, personal, you know, hyper-personal poetry, uh, or uh, life lyric, as I like to call it now, um, opens itself up to this because you can't really confess the self and re without confessing the other, because we're all social beings. And when you think of Lowell's life studies, it's mostly about other people until the end. Um, uh, what I wanted to add to this is, you know, it's uh, William Carlos Williams used Marcia Nardi's uh, language without her permission, and she was furious, and he was terrified that she was going to sue him. Uh, and uh, to this, you know, now um, Patterson, uh, you know, the copyright is to her as well as to um, William Carlos Williams, as it should be. Um, and I think now Hardwick is getting, you know, some sort of uh, belated credit for her contributions, even though, you know, she didn't, uh, you know, it was a misuse, uh, but, but still there are her words in that, that poem wouldn't exist without her words. Um, uh, uh, 
if I remember correctly, Elizabeth Bishop was worried that Helena Morley was going to uh, was going to sue her for increased royalties or something like that. And then uh, Joan Gilling, the character in um, The Bell Jar, uh, the person who claims to be or is uh, the source for that character, uh, successfully sued Sylvia Plath's uh, um, estate for you know, for using her life story without permission. So I think this is a very wide, um, generic and also temporal uh, phenomenon and, with, and a complex one too, uh, though, you know, there are lines to be drawn. I'm uh, certainly Lowell in his mania uh, uh, crossed over it unforgivably. Anybody want to say any, anything about that? Well, maybe I, I also have a question for, for Hannah. And I was wondering um, if you could perhaps also connect it to Kay Redfield Jameson's uh, book, Setting the River on Fire, which for, for me really sort of reshapes the whole biography of Robert Lowell um, more as a person who suffered so much from, from his mental disposition. And um, I, I agree with a lot of things you say also about the, the, the stealing of the, of the, of the letters, um, but there's such a sadness in the dolphin. Um, and I, I totally agree with, also with Frank um, about yeah, just what the pervasive emotion that I have sort of from this whole history is just how incredibly sad it is um, and tragic. Um, and I was wondering if you, if that mitigates the, the anger a little bit or not at all. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, that um, the Jameson sort of by I don't know if I should call it a biography or or what exactly it is, but you're right. Like I think it's particularly sad to see how after the mania, when he's in his more depressive state, he then regrets everything he did like during the mania. Um, and so to kind of understand that the way that he suffered and also the way that he I guess blamed himself or felt guilty over whatever he had done is is deeply depressing. Um, and then also it's it's also angering too because I think he mixes his own like self accusation with Hardwick's voice um, in such a mean way where Hardwick sounds like she's inside the poet's psyche like accusing him as like this mean inner critic and so that feels problematic almost like he's projecting his own self hatred like onto her not to over psychoanalyze but I just did <laughs> um, yeah but that's really interesting yeah there's a lot of yeah, a lot of really interesting work about Lowell um, in that, that book in particular is, is definitely interesting. And it does, it made me feel bad for Lowell, which I guess is, is a weird thing, but um, definitely, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Great, thanks. Maybe just to follow that up. Sorry, Hannah, we're all having a go at you uh, or talking to you, but because um, in, in the Bishop letter to Lowell about the dolphin, and she said it's taken weeks to write this, and she says, you know, the poems affect me profoundly and immediately. Uh, you know, so she uses, you know, that, you go back to Adam's paper, you know, she, she takes the term of affect, sticks it into, it into the letter. But I think one of the things about Bishop is that she's so very careful, you know, to put distances between herself and anything that could be deemed to be personal uh, or you know I always get stuck on the word confessional and it rattles in my head because I just disagree with it so profoundly as a term because Berryman did you know the word doesn't mean anything he says in his Paris Review interview even Rosenthal in 1967 dismisses the idea of the confessional so so I find that I find using the confessional just as if it's a given uh, it's not a given um, and I think Bishop kind of the way she put, positions herself because she knows that all of this is personal and but that art must have distance from the self from selves from the other selves as as Steve was talking earlier yeah I think you know there's something about how Bishop does it and refuses to do it the way Lowell did it or Berryman there's some hilarious entries in in Bishop's journal <laughs> Uh, and a letter to Anne Sexton and then letters about Anne Sexton where she's like, oh my God, I've got another letter from Anne Sexton. <laughs> and Sexton, Sexton famously sends Bishop a letter and then goes out again that night having written another letter and sends it to her and goes, sorry, I meant to send you this even longer letter. And Bishop was like, Jesus, this woman. Um, so I think there is something about that sort of 
resisting the personal, the confessional, that, that I, you know, I do think Berryman was trying to do that, even though he does load his poems with quite a lot of his own information. But, you know, I think immediately jumping to the confessional is something to be careful about, but that the, the, the affective turn of that kind of poetry that Bishop recognizes, you know, I think that's something she's doing in much sort of longer, darker, uh, deeper ways, perhaps. I have a feeling that resistance to the confessional is at the heart of the confessional. And there's always yeah. this uh, element in all of them of embarrassment and denial. Um, so it's very, very complicated. I've given up fighting against the, I've got out, I've got over to the other side. Uh, because, you know, <laughs> romanticism doesn't tell you anything either, does it really? It doesn't tell me. No, anything. maybe not. So, uh, so the idea of a signifier cut off from the signified seems you know, fine to me now, but that's just okay. Okay. Anybody anybody have anything else that, that they would really like to say? It's been really a stimulating uh, 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 session and with four wonderful papers and I like uh, I had, a, I had a quick question for Philip. So if um if the term confessional, like if, if that's thrown out and rejected, and I agree, Stephen, there was a great deal of you know uh pushback on that at the time but would you would you give it another term or is, yeah like, what would, would you use to kind of create the uh the I'd call them the middle generation, and uh, it's a lot easier. Um, and that sort of boxes off that time period. Uh, I wouldn't go confessional. You know, like Sexton famously, you know, the poem Unknown Girl in Maternity Ward, she's interviewed about that. And she says, well, it wasn't true. It didn't happen to me, but it is the truth. It's a true thing that happens to people. Uh, so I think just call them the middle generation. It seems, it seems a lot of hassle yeah. for me. I think one problem, Philip, is that there's confessional or what most people now call post-confessional writing to this present yeah. day. It's really proliferated and it's evolved in different directions. And there's the queer confessional, and there's all yeah. sorts of, um, and there's, uh, you know, uh, two camera confessions in reality TV. There's just so many proliferations of it that mm. it isn't just confined to the middle generation. So the middle generation like does something, but like, Everything, every category, it you know, uh, it you know, it has its own blindness as well as its own insight. I guess. Yeah, yeah, and I also like, I agree. Uh, I also see poems like "Formal Elegy" by Berryman as a very public, political poem about Kennedy's assassination. Yeah, so, you know, it's not that they only troll their own private personal pain for poetry. There's a whole world of stuff out there. And I think actually the fact that Berryman is talking about the nuclear threat, you know, makes it much more of a public political poetry than necessarily a personal one. Right. I think that's an inherent part of the confessional too, which the word confessional yeah. absolutely doesn't, doesn't get at. But yeah. all the confessional poems that we care about have some kind of social implication beyond the simply personal. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I want to thank you all again so much for being here and for speaking and uh, uh, see, you, see you next time, hopefully. Yeah. Thanks, Dave, for doing this. Okay. Thank you, Steve, so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good day. Well, Frank, thank you so much for being here again and for being the life of the party, as you always are. Okay. I'll say bye-bye for now. Yeah, take care. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Steve.